I'm alive and standing here on the stage today because the night before I filmed my Kickstarter video, a man on the other end of a suicide hotline convinced me not to kill myself. I was panicked and curled up on the floor of my room, desperately clawing tears in my skin with my fingernails, panicking, and desperately trying to make all of the pain that was waging a war in my mind disappear. The next morning, I woke up at 6.30 in the morning, put makeup on my arms, and filmed a Kickstarter video that would go on to be 78% fund, 178% funded and land me in news articles across the country. That, like many of the things in this talk, are secrets I've kept hidden from everyone in my life, ex with the exception of a therapist. And today is the first time my family, my friends, my roommates, my teachers, my co-founders will ever hear that. For all of you who know me, I'm incredibly sorry. My name is Isla Foxlin, and I'm an entrepreneur and the former founder of a company called Perihug. The world sees entrepreneurs as the knights of the tech era, riding in on thoroughbred horses made of bugless code and wielding cheaply manufactured swords, promising much higher returns than their reality. Bonus points, by the way, if the horse is named something along the lines of Bitcoin and the sword has AI installed. Toby Thomas at Inc. 500 CEO, I think shatters this illusion the best. He uses the analogy of a man riding on a lion. And everyone's looking at this person on a lion and thinking, wow, look at them, they're so brave, they're riding on a lion. But let me tell you, the person up on the lion is sitting there like, how the hell did I get up here? And how do I keep from getting eaten? I learned a lot in my journey as an entrepreneur, but here's the hardest lesson that I learned of all. When I say the phrase raising capital to this room of people, my guess is that every single one of you thought of investment, of venture capital. But I would argue that you're wrong. The most valuable resource for a startup is not the venture capital, the dollars that it raises, but the human capital. It's the strength, the well-being, the creativity, and the emotional health of the people that bring that company to life. My company, Perihug, should have made it. We made these adorable stuffed animals that were internet connected and let you hug loved ones from anywhere in the world. It was a great idea with huge market and early success. It had a founder story that people wanted to cheer for. It was a 19-year-old biracial girl in Ohio who was building this because she wanted to make the world a better place, and it showed. But the reality is that Perihug failed because after two years of the same thing, that founder didn't have the strength to get out of bed in the morning. She didn't have the fearlessness to talk down all of the cynics' criticisms anymore. And she didn't have the courage to stand up on her own again. The worst part is the recipe that got me there is predictable, common, and preventable. And when I say common, according to a study by Michael Freeman at the University of San Francisco, 72% of entrepreneurs struggle with mental health disorders. And 38% turn to alcohol, according to the Halifax-based Mindset Project. I can't speak for anyone but myself, but now that I have some distance from Perihug, I have a stronger understanding of this recipe that brought me down. So the first ingredient is probably the most obvious and maybe widely talked about one, and that is startup culture. So entrepreneurs, and I'm generalizing here, so please, nobody take offense, but entrepreneurs like to brag about the long hours that they work and how little sleep they're getting and how much risk they're running and how stressed out that makes them. I once found myself at an entrepreneurship conference sitting at a table with two entrepreneurs who were arguing over who had had more anxiety attacks that month. I think it goes without saying, but that's not super healthy. It's literally a competition to see who has the worst mental health. Because in our sleep-deprived, anxiety-ridden brains, poor mental health is a sign of dedication to your company and a predictor of future success. Spoiler alert, it's not. So the next one I find really interesting, and it's something that I like to call the PR machine. And I think it's interesting because 
We become entrepreneurs in many cases because we want to be our own boss. But the reality is that for a consumer-facing company, you're not your own boss. The PR machine is your boss. We might be signing our own paychecks, but that paycheck has to come from somewhere, and that somewhere is consumers, and consumers find you because of PR. But it has a flip side. PR for humans can be incredibly dangerous. We've seen this with celebrities, so looking at you 90s like Lindsay Lohan and Britney Spears. But it can have that effect on a really small scale as well. So let's take, for example, my experience. And we're going to ignore all of the national and all of the Consumer Electronics Show coverage and just look at the media here at the Case Western campus. We had annual reports. We had the daily, which is exactly what it sounds like, our daily newsletter. We had photos, videos, social media, admissions brochures. And this was incredibly beneficial to my company and provided a tremendous amount of opportunity. Don't get me wrong. But it had a flip side. As a really silly example, does my Tinder date actually want to get to know me? Or do they just want bragging rights for the rest of college that they took xylofoxalin out to dinner? But the worst part of this, I think, is that it caused the third ingredient, which is something called tall poppy syndrome. Now, if you haven't heard this, that's OK. It's a kind of funny sounding Australian term for that describes aspects of culture where people of high status are resented, attacked, cut down, strung up, or criticized because they have been classified as superior to their peers. Thank you, Wikipedia. I founded Perihug when I was a sophomore in college. As the people around me were figuring out how to take college exams and ask boys out on dates, I was flying all over the country, figuring out how to get pitched to investors, hire a team, and manufacture a product. My first panic attack was caused by something as simple as a roommate screaming at me for leaving a dirty spoon in the sink, wishing I would just move out. That same semester, one of my professors told me his goal of the semester was to fail me out. And another one kicked me out of his class and told me to stop acting like I was special because I'd requested, with the support of my academic advisor, to reschedule an exam because I'd been invited to the White House that day. The Obama White House, for the record. <laughs> <laughs> and in hindsight, I get it. If you've spent your entire career researching something that's so important to you, and this student shows up with these stupid teddy bears, I would feel underappreciated too. But that said, these are just a few of my own examples. It doesn't matter how old an entrepreneur is or what stage of life they're in. They will be different from their peers no matter what. We don't really think of entrepreneurship is a dangerous thing. We don't send our kids off to school and say, hey, while you're there, watch out for drugs, watch out for alcohol, and ooh, watch out for entrepreneurship. And I'm not trying to say that it is, but we need to understand that the entrepreneurial journey is incredibly complicated. It has highs and lows unlike anything else in life. And at least for me, each high got higher, and each low got dangerously lower. As food for thought, though, I really can't tell you if all of this is caused by entrepreneurship and by starting companies or if there's a kind of person that goes and is good at entrepreneurship. And I think that it's both and that it's a cyclic process. According to Michael Freeman, people who are on the energetic, motivated, and creative side are both more likely to be entrepreneurial and more likely to have strong emotional states. And what are some examples of those emotional states? Well, you have enthusiasm, inspiration, creativity, excitement, but also depression, anxiety, despair, and suicidal thinking. When I was working on Perry Hug, it became my identity. I was the living, breathing personification of my company. When we were featured in magazines and news articles, I was featured in magazines and news articles. But when we got bad reviews and mean comments, I got bad reviews and mean comments. And most importantly, when Perry Hook failed, I failed. And because it was my entire identity, 
I did not just fail as an entrepreneur. I failed as a daughter, as a friend, as a roommate, as a mentor, as a role model. I failed as a person. And that's extremely dangerous, because according to a Price Waterhouse study, 96% of technology companies fail by year five. 96%. Think of all of the technology companies out there, 96% of their founders, what if only half of them even had stories like mine? So give any entrepreneurs you know a big hug tonight. And remind them that they're worth so much more than the success of their company. Investors, don't just invest money. Invest in your founder's mental health. Don't encourage them to fall into a dangerous lifestyle. And most importantly, remember that money isn't the only runway a startup can run out of. And entrepreneurs, remember that you, the person, are worth so much more than the value of your company. But if that doesn't do it for you, because I know it definitely did not do it for me, remember that the value of your company is so much higher if you have the emotional capital to see it all the way through. Thank you.